Most people don't know this, but ducks are very monogamous creatures. And because of their loyalty when it comes to love, it has become an emblem of affection and marriage in China. And they're portrayed in wooden carvings and art associated with the Mandarin version of Valentine's Day. Duck figurines are also common at weddings because once they've found their partner, they mate for life and remain faithful, becoming the perfect symbol of fidelity, marriage, and making love. In some Native American cultures, ducks are seen as a naive and foolish creature that makes a target for the trickster animals in myths and legends. But in some other parts, they are revered as the only bird able to bring land for other animals and the creator by diving deep into the ocean. The duck in biblical teachings is a positive symbol associated with prosperity, enlightenment, and protection. I should probably also mention that for all swans, geese, cranes, storks, and a few others, long-term monogamy is also the preferred relationship. I just happen to like feeding these ducks here the most. While ducks may practice monogamy, this is not always the case among humans, particularly in regards to esoteric religious practices. The Clists were an underground spiritual Christian sect which split from the Russian Orthodox Church and existed from the 1600s until the late 20th century. The members of this sect refer to themselves by various names, including God's people, followers of Christ's faith, or simply Christs, which is where the term Christi comes from. They're also called Clisti with an L. While this may be a derogatory corruption of the term Christi, Clist in Russian also means whip, and the sect is known for the ritual of self-flagulation, a practice of flogging oneself with whips or other instruments to bring about pain seen as a spiritual discipline. That said, another more likely possibility is that the word is related to the Greek word kilistiet, meaning millennialist. The term millennialism is from millennium, which means a thousand years, and is an occult Kabbalistic concept incorporated into both Messianic Christianity and Judaism, which believe that a golden age or paradise will occur on earth prior to the final judgment and future eternal state of the world to come. Similarities to millennialism appear in Zoroastrianism, the ancient Aryan religion of Iran featuring the Mithraic mysteries, which identified successive thousand-year periods, each of which will end in a cataclysm of heresy and destruction until the final destruction of evil and the spirit of evil by a triumphant king of peace at the end of the final millennial age. Elements of this can also be seen in nationalist Germany, where the German chancellor was seen as a messianic figure or savior by his inner circle and would publicly proclaim his intentions of establishing a thousand-year Reich, which means kingdom or empire. The German nationalist, and particularly the SS, were steeped in occult philosophy and were not atheists, but similar to an esoteric religious order. After Nationalist Germany's unsuccessful attempt to implement a thousand year reign, the Vatican issued an official statement that millennial claims could not be safely taught and that the related biblical scriptures in Revelation, also called the Apocalypse, should only be understood spiritually. This line of thought, however, still exists, being much more common than most people are aware of, and is also mirrored in other spiritual movements, for example, the Baha'i faith, that maintains that it expects a renewal of the city of God every thousand years. 
Jehovah's Witnesses believe that Christ will return and will rule from heaven for a thousand years as king over earth. The Theosophist Alice Bailey taught that a messianic figure would return sometime after the year 2025 and that this would be the New Age equivalent of the Christian concept of the Second Coming of Christ. There are more examples of millennialism linked to modern political movements that claim to be attempts to fulfill biblical prophecy, but they fall outside of the scope of this presentation. In regards to the Clisti, they renounce priesthood, holy books, and veneration of the saints, except for Mary, or the goddess figure and instead believed in the possibility of direct communication with the Holy Spirit, which they believed could descend upon any of them during the state of orgasmic ecstasy, which they attained during the ritual of rejoicing. This ritual, which formed the focus of their worship, took place on holy feast days. The congregation would gather during the evening at a prearranged location such as a member's house, they would remove their outer clothing and enter the sacred space, usually naked or just wearing undergarments, where they would engage in a period of singing or chanting and wild dancing until they felt the Holy Spirit come upon them. This would continue for sometimes hours until the dancers entered into a trance-like state and collapsed with exhaustion. They abstained from alcohol and often fasted for days or weeks at a time. That said, this whirling dance was considered, quote, spiritual beer and allegedly had an intoxicating effect on the members, reminiscent of certain Islamic Sufi sects, which also have a similar spiritually motivated dancing. According to some accounts, after the members fell to the floor after dancing, they would engage in group sinning, a frenzied sexual orgy, which they believed would purify them from the lusts of the flesh, that salvation could be attained only by total repentance, and that this became far more achievable for one who had truly transgressed. Sin in order that you may obtain forgiveness was their motto a slogan which has a striking similarity to the title of one of my books called 1666, Redemption Through Sin. I did a recent video on this topic that I'll leave a link to in the description called 1666 and the Dark Messiah for those that are interested. It is evident that this form of holy intercourse was not practiced by one isolated sect but stems from an ancient old world religion that traces its roots deep into antiquity and prehistory. They did have marriage for practical purposes, including having children, but considered regular intercourse as a sin, even with one's own wife, and instead engaged in these occult rituals which involved the transmutation of sex energy, similar to tantric kundalini practices in the East. Accusations of sexual immorality pursued the sect from its earliest days and provoked numerous government investigations. From 1733 to 1739, a specially formed government commission arrested hundreds of suspected Clist members, charging them with participation in sexual orgies, engaging in ritual sacrifice, and certain cannibalistic, alleged practices involving blood, with over 300 people convicted. However, the Cliss were undeterred and continued practicing. This brings us to Grigory Rasputin, who was investigated twice in 1903 and 1907 under charges of spreading Cliss doctrine. <laughs> Grigory Rasputin was a Russian mystic and self-proclaimed holy man who was born to a peasant family in a small Siberian village in 1869. In 1887, he got married and by 1897, 
Rasputin developed an intense interest in religion and went on a pilgrimage to a monastery where he had a religious conversion experience. He became a vegetarian, swore off of alcohol, and wandered the country visiting a variety of holy sites, praying and singing fervently. <laughs> Rasputin held secret prayer meetings where female followers would ceremonially wash him before each meeting, followed by ecstatic rituals which included self-flagellation and sexual orgies. It was rumored that Rasputin had joined the Klists, an underground sect which split off from the Russian Orthodox Church and existed from 1645 to the late 20th century. They believed in the possibility of direct communication with the Holy Spirit through sin, practicing ecstatic rituals that turned into religious group orgies. That said, the sect was also said to practice a form of ascetism, a lifestyle characterized by abstinence from sensual pleasures often for the purpose of pursuing spiritual goals. Ascetism has been historically observed in many religious traditions, including Buddhism, Jainism, Hinduism, Christianity, Judaism, and even mainstream Islam in the form of fasting, as well as in Sufi Islam. While most people interpret chastity to mean avoidance of sex entirely, initiates of secret societies understand that it is not sexual unions that are avoided, but fornication, or in other words, ejaculation. In the case of Rasputin, he rejected the homosexuality that he witnessed between many of the monks, but did not reject sex. His religious prayers seemed to focus on constant hedonistic orgies, but never to completion. This practice was said to have aided him in attaining supernatural healing abilities, magnetic charisma, clairvoyance, and allegedly would lead him to spiritual redemption. One can see similarities with the teachings of Sabbatai Zevi, a self-proclaimed messiah in 1666, who also pursued higher spiritual abilities and redemption through sin, which also translated into orgies, wife swapping, incest, pedophilia, and other outlawed rituals. I should also mention Jacob Frank here, who also claimed to be a messiah, as well as the reincarnation of Sabbatai Zevi. Frank worked with Adam Weishaupt to usher in the Illuminati, which was backed by Rothschild financing. <laughs> There was talk that during his wanderings he had fallen in with the secret sect called the Klisti. The Klisti had a very particular kind of worship that was nothing like the Orthodox Church. They would gather, they would sing, they would pray, and they would work themselves into a kind of frenzy, which they called radienia, or ecstasy. And in the process of doing that, they would begin to dance and whirl about and become almost drunk on spinning. They actually called it spiritual beer, this dancing, this whirling. At that point where they had actually sort of built themselves into a fever pitch, they would then fall on the ground. Then what began was a kind of congregational orgy where everybody just engaged in copulation with whoever was next to them. And there was sex going on all over the place. Of course, there were various sects that had variations on these religious rituals, which differed in the extremity to which they took their practices. Of the most extreme were called Skopsky, which is Russian for eunuch, a term used by the official Russian Orthodox Church, as they were best known for practicing castration of men and mastectomy of women in accordance with their teachings against sexual lust. 
they referred to themselves as white doves, and their aim was to perfect the individual by eradicating original sin, which they believed had come into the world by the first coitus between Adam and Eve. They believed that the true message of Jesus Christ included the practice of castration, that Jesus himself had been a castrate, and that his example had been followed by the apostles and the early Christian saints. They had extreme interpretations of the Garden of Eden story, and during the surgery performed on members, they would exclaim during the operation the phrase, Christ is risen. According to the King James Bible, we read in Matthew 19.12, quote, For there are some eunuchs which were born from their mother's womb, and there are some eunuchs which were made eunuchs of men, and there be eunuchs which have made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake. He that is able to receive it, let him receive it. That said, Rasputin was not part of this sect, which branched off from the Clisti, as he clearly kept his member intact. These religious orgies were an essential part of the Clisti doctrine. They believed that by deliberately committing a carnal sin, they could repent more fervently and so get closer to God. They called it sinning to drive out sin, and it was an idea and a practice that Rasputin immediately seized hold of. These people were actually able to achieve peculiar mystical and religious states by going to these extremes. Now, I think that's what Rasputin had discovered. Extreme religious states that he was able to get into occasionally by going through what he felt to be sinful. Rasputin went on to build a chapel in a pit beneath his house where he claimed to be a higher being and urged people to merge with him. There were rumors that as a part of a religious service, he would have sex with his congregation, during which he claimed to have seen a vision of the Virgin Mary, and she apparently told him to go to St. Petersburg, where he would help the imperial family. While on his travels, he had impressed a number of aristocrats and clerics, and word had spread 1,600 miles away to St. Petersburg of a strange, wandering holy man with powers of clairvoyance and healing. The city was the ultimate seat of power and home to Tsar Nicholas II and Empress Alexandra, two of the most powerful rulers in the world. All sorts of society ladies found a magnetic charm, even perhaps a sexual attraction, simply in his physical appearance. And it was in the privacy of the St. Petersburg bathhouses that Rasputin's new religious doctrine really took shape. Increasingly, he was seen entering bathhouses with both aristocrats and prostitutes. For Russian peasants, bathhouses were places of magic and superstition. Most Siberians were born in one, and there were places to conjure spirits, both good and evil. Speaking of bathhouses, many people have taken notice of the similarities between the temple structure on billionaire sex trafficker Jeffrey Epstein's island with bathhouses in various parts of the world, particularly the Middle East, like this one in Aleppo, Syria. Could it be that the secretive and allegedly illegal activities that took place on Lolita Island were more than just recreational, but included rituals that date back not only to the time of Rasputin or Frank or Zevi, but even further back in history, to the sex cults of ancient Babylon. My name is Robert Sepper. I'm an anthropologist. My published work is available on Amazon and through all other major book outlets. If you'd like to support my work, you can do that through patreon.com. There should be a link in the description. Please subscribe for future updates. Leave your thoughts below. Have a wonderful weekend, and I hope to see you again soon.